This man was a leper. Something so wrong that it messed up everything that was so right. And there was no cure. It was incurable. So he is both simultaneously a captain, a conqueror, and a castaway. Most importantly, leprosy is tied to something going wrong spiritually. This man, with everything right, has one thing wrong messing up all that is right. What is your leprosy? What is that one thing in your life that is messing up all the good stuff going for you? Uh, maybe you're successful in your career or with your finances or with your educational achievements. And maybe you can hand out a resume that is impressive, but there's that one thing that you dare not put on it. That was Naaman's reality. That was his scenario. He had the, the butt phrase, but he was a leper. The footnote on his life, affecting everything. Well, we're told in verse 2 that in one of his battles, he captured a little slave girl. She told Naaman's wife, if we could get your husband, my boss, down to Israel to the prophet, Elisha, I believe Elisha could change his leprosy situation. She was a little girl. She was a nobody in terms of her position in life and her age in life, but she knew somebody. She had a hookup and a connection that could change this man's world and this man's life. So Naaman goes to his boss, the king, and says, this little girl told my wife who told me that I may be able to get my problem solved by the prophet in Israel. So the king, watch this, the king of Aram, verse 5, says, go now and I'm going to send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed, he took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 changes of clothes, brought them to the king of Israel. And he says, I've sent name in my servant, verse 6, to you that you may cure him of his leprosy. Well, wait a minute. That's not what the little girl said. The little girl said, there's a prophet in Israel that can cure his leprosy. Verse 9, so Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the house of Elisha. He knocks on Elisha's door. Uh-oh, verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> we, we have some issues going on here and the issue is explained to us in verse 11. But Naaman was furious, ticked off, mad, and went away and said, Behold, I thought, I'm coming back to that. He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand, hocus pocus, over the place and cure the leprosy. The end of verse 12 says, he went away in a rage. Because he said, are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? Turned away, ticked off. It's called leaning to your own understanding. It's called throwing your human opinion at God. It's called pride. He said, Jordan's too dirty. Uh, let, me, let me tell you something. It's a bad idea to stay outside the ark just because dirty animals are going in it. It's, it's a bad idea 
when them nasty animals, two by two, are coming out, I ain't going in that ark. It's going to be stinky in there, animals in there, all that refuse in there. I ain't going in that. Okay, you're going to die. So his servant comes to him and says, verse 13, my father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, give him another million, give him this, give him that, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says, go wash and be clean? If he'd have given you something hard, you'd have gladly gone and done it. He'd give you something easy. And now you're going to fuss and cuss and get mad at the prophet, get mad at the church. You're just going to get mad because they didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. That's not the question. The question is, was what they told you God's word and God's will? That's the only question. So, verse 14, he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. Watch this. According to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Don't let your dignity keep you from solving your problem. Partial obedience will not bring full deliverance. In fact, it may bring no deliverance. Because he was not delivered until after that seventh time. He had to complete what God was asking him to do. A lot of times people get mad. They say, I tried. I did what God said. But when you dig down deep enough, they did a part of what God said. They obeyed him enough to feel better about it. But they did not go all the way and complete what he had asked them to do. Until obedience has been completed, you cannot expect a supernatural incursion into your circumstances to calm it, correct it, and reverse it to whatever level the sovereign will of God will allow for. You and I must stop arguing with God's word. His word is final, it is settled in heaven, and sometimes you won't like it, and sometimes you won't understand it. In fact, if you can read your doctor's prescription, he's not a real doctor. <laughs> but even though you can't fully read it, even though you don't fully understand it, you go to the pharmacist, you fulfill it, and you take it because you trust the one who gave it. We say, well, I don't understand, I don't understand, so I'm not going to do anything. So you stay sick. Because even though you may not understand God's prescription, it's his prescription. And he knows what's really wrong. But until you take the medicine, not take the prescription, hear the sermon, no, you must take the medicine, that is, full obedience to see the supernatural into the natural to cure that which appears to be and actually functions as that which is incurable in your life. What is your leprosy? I want to tell you now, related to whatever deliverance God is going to give you for that thing that will not go away, that until you adopt, I adopt, we adopt radical obedience. That's obedience to the end. Even to the point of rejecting our own perspective or that of our friends. You'll not see God. You'll talk about him. You'll sing songs to him. You'll worship him, but you won't see him. You won't see this power that the Bible talks about, this victory that the Bible talks about. Because God's got to see faith and faith is demonstrated by the walk, by the thing you do, not the thing you think, feel, or say. When a person gets stuck in quicksand, they go to what is natural to them. When you, none of us probably have been in quicksand, but you've seen movies where people are in quicksand, and they go to what's natural. And what's natural is to flail your arms to try to get yourself out of this thing that's sucking you up. 
Well, the reason quicksand sucks you up is that it is sand mixed with water. When sand gets mixed with water, it removes the friction of sand being on sand. So since sand is no longer on sand, but now sand has been mixed with water, the friction of sand being with sand is no longer there. So the more you try to get out of it, the more it's sucking you under. The harder you try to get out of it, the harder it's sucking you under because you don't have anything with enough friction to push you against it. So when you push against it, the water is just with the sand is just drawing you down. But you're doing what's natural. If you get caught in quicksand, you have to do what is unnatural. You have to go against your natural inclination to fight to get out. And you must relax, which slows down the process of you being pulled down, which gives you time to paddle, not fight. And when you rest and paddle, which is against your natural inclination, you find out deliverance is possible. You go to what you naturally think is right. And you are aiding and abetting your demise. That's how it is with God. Sometimes uh, when God wants to do something, you have to go against your natural inclination. What is natural to your, your mind, your will, your desires, your goal. Because you want to be delivered. His flesh, verse 14, became like the flesh of a little child. Whoa. Okay, don't, don't read that too fast. Wait a minute. He came to be delivered. He came up the seventh time. Not only was he delivered, but God took him all the way back to babyhood. He got delivered and restored. God reversed that thing. It took him as a grown man and it took him to the day he came out of his mother's womb as a child or an infant. God is so powerful. Not only can he cure what's been a problem for years, he can take you back before it was a problem at all. That's called exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. It says, he's saying, heal me. God says, I'm going to make you like a little baby. Why does God leave you in an incurable situation so we can get around to finding out who God really is? He doesn't just want to be your buddy. He doesn't want to be just another guy. He wants to show you when he shows out and shows off, he's in a class all by himself. Psalm 103 verses 2 and 3 says, He forgives our sins and he heals our diseases. He claimed God was the only God, but look at something else he does as we... Come to an end, verse 17. If not, please let your servant at least be given two mules load of earth. For your servant will no longer offer burnt offerings, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Ooh. He said, watch this. The dirt I didn't want to go down in, Jordan. I want two loads of it and two mules. Because I'm carrying this dirt back with me. Because on this dirt, I'm going to build me an altar so I can worship the only true God. I'm taking my blessing with me. Everywhere I go, I'm going to make a pile of dirt. I'm going to set up my altar and I'm going to worship God. Because guess what? When God delivers you like this, when he takes away your leprosy, when he reverses something that's been messing with you for days, months, years, and decades, and you come to see this is no joke. God is no joke. He can meet you in your deepest hole, reverse you back to a baby status. You're going to want that God every place else you go. There's another verse I want to mention in closing. Luke 4.27 says, There were many lepers in Israel, but God healed none of them except Naaman. Now that's in the New Testament. Jesus is talking. 
He said there were many folk like Naaman in Israel. But none of those folk in Israel who are my people got healed from their leprosy except a foreigner named Naaman because he's not a Jew. What's he saying? You can be part of the people of God and never see God work. You can come to church every week. You can be an Israelite and a leper and live the rest of your life as a leper because you refuse to do what a foreigner did. A foreigner bleeds God, tell the end, got a miracle, the folk in church worship God, got nothing because of their unbelief. We have in our community a lot of places that clean things. We have cleaners that cleans clothes. We have car washes, it cleans cars. We've got nail salons, it cleans messed up nails and cuticles. People go into those places because something dirty and messed up needs to be corrected and cleansed. That's why they go in there. And when they come out, something is different. You go pick up your clothes and the cleaners has cleaned them. You come out of the hair salon and the hair is, is now clean and it's, and it's been uh, shaped and, and, and straightened or curled or whatever y'all do. It, it is, it, the, the hair is, is, is all right now. You take your car to the car wash. You drive it to the car wash. It comes out different than it came in. You go to the nail salon with dirty nails, the nails come out, the nails have been cleaned, they've been shaped, they've been uh, uh, colored, you know, you come out different than you went in. Now the reason why you come out different than when you went in is when you went in, you did exactly what they asked you to do. The cleaner said, give me the clothes and turn it over to me. You turn it over to them, then you back clean clothes. You hook the car up, you drive it up to the place they tell you, they hook it up, you go and you wait, you do what they tell you to do, comes out clean. You put your nails over here, you do, you do what they tell you to do and you come out different. But in the church, folk coming to the church dirty, hear from God what to do, and leave the same way they came in because they refused to do what the instruction manual demanded. So if you want to see God in your situation, you're going to have to put down your pride, put down your notoriety. You can't be like the guy who used to come to our church. He was well known in the community, very wealthy. He came to the church, joined the church. He said, I want to meet with you. He wanted to meet with me. I said, yes, when we met. He said, I want to be a leader. I said, excuse me? He said, I want to be a leader. Well, I said, okay, well, there's a process you have to go through. We want to see you faithful in ministry. He said, I don't need to do all that. He said, you know, you, do you know who I am? I said, I know who you are. He said, yeah, and uh, a lot of churches. They shouldn't hit me with that line. A lot of churches would be happy to have me in their leadership. I, I told him, well, I'll give you directions to one of them. Which one you want? What he was trying to do was use Naaman's money, clout, and power to buy position. That's not how it happens in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, you got to go low in spite of your notoriety, degrees, money, position, and power. You got to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. When we do to completion, what God has said do, you've opened yourself up to a Jordan experience, even in a dirty place. And by the way, the greatest miracle of all, Paul tells Timothy, the pastor of Ephesus Bible Fellowship, that I want you to teach the congregation how men ought to conduct themselves, how men ought to live their lives, who are part of the household of God, part of the family of God. And I want you to do that, but I want you to explain to them the mystery of godliness. He says this mystery is by common confession, meaning everybody ought to agree with it. Common confession means everybody's saying the same thing. 
Everybody understanding it the same way. It's common to everybody. So I want to explain to this fellowship the mystery. Whatever this mystery is, it's a beast. Because he says great is the mystery. He says there is a mystery about godliness that was unclear in the Old Testament that now has been made clear in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 8, we're coming right back here to 1 Timothy, but Hebrews chapter 8 is one place that summarizes this. In verse 6 of Hebrews 8, it says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. But as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Verse 10, for this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. They shall not teach everyone his fellow citizens and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord for all will know me from the least of the to the greatest of them for I will be merciful to their iniquities. I will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, New Testament, he has made the first obsolete, Old Testament, but whatever is becoming obsolete is growing old, is ready to disappear. So, God says I'm making a new arrangement, covenant, testament, that will make obsolete the Old Testament covenant and the new Testament covenant is better than the Old Testament covenant, which means if you're living in the Old Testament, you're missing the New Testament. If you're living in the Old Testament, you're living under something that has been made obsolete. Now, I'll explain what that means in a moment. Because of something better that has come along. The mystery between the two covenants, Old Testament, New Testament, is a mystery related to how you become godly. It's the mystery of godliness. It's the mysterious understanding of how we consistently are to reflect the character of God in our lives. In the Old Covenant Testament, you were told what you must do and you were told it negatively. Let's take the Ten Commandments, which is a summary of the Old Covenant. Thou shalt not, 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 thou shalt not. So you were told in a negative way what you ought not do in the old covenant. But in Hebrews 8, the scripture we just read, we went from you must and you shouldn't to I will. He says in the new covenant, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. In the old covenant, you better not, you better not, you better not, you better not, you better not. He says that the new covenant, which is a mystery because it wasn't revealed fully in the Old Testament, is better. Many years ago, before the advancement of technology, your grandparents or great-grandparents cleaned their clothes with a scrubbing board. They got the scrubbing board out, they got the pail of water, and they would scrub and scrub and scrub to make dirty clothes clean. And every week, or how often they did it, they would have to roll up their sleeves because they were trying to make something dirty clean for their children themselves or their mate to wear. And the way they did it was by scrubbing the mess out. Then along came washing machines. The goal of the washing machine was the very same goal of the scrubbing board. But the power to pull off is different. The scrubbing board that grandmother used to use depended on elbow grease. And her ability to go up and down, up and down, wring it out, twist it. Then can another piece go up and down, up and down. The power to get it clean depended on her. But in the new covenant called the washing machine versus the old covenant called the scrubbing board, while the purpose was the same, the power was different. Because the power 
to get it clean was residing in the machine, not in the elbow grease of grandma. The old covenant is elbow grease. It's, I'm going to make myself better. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to try to do better. I promise. I rededicate. Then I rededicate my rededication that I rededicated the last time I rededicated. And so I'm scrubbing and I'm scrubbing and I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm getting tired because every week I got to clean this thing up again. That's the old covenant. The new covenant is the washing machine. Which means that the power in the new covenant, the washing machine, is greater than the power in the old covenant, my elbows. Because the washing machine, new covenant, was built in such a way that it has more power to clean things than my effort can ever do on my own. I dare say, once grandma got a washing machine, she discarded her scrubbing board. Because to go back to the scrubbing board was now to go back to something obsolete. It was to go back to something that would not produce what this new thing, this new invention. If cleanliness is used for godliness under the new covenant, which is better than the old covenant, it's what God will do, not what you do. One of the problems is Christians who dance between covenants. They use the washing machine this week and the board that week. The washing machine this week and the board that week. And they wonder why some weeks I'm really clean, godly, and other weeks I'm not so clean, godly, because you're shifting covenants. He said, once you have a washing machine, you do not go back to the board. You don't go back there because to go back there is to retreat to something inferior. And that's why it's a mystery because it was not clear like this in the Old Testament. Let's go a little further. He says under this mystery that's awesome, he calls it great. And it has to do with being godly. That is lifestyles consistent with the manifestation of character of God, he says, has to do with a person. Please notice. He says in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16, he was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among nations, believed on in the world, taken up the glory. So he speaks about Jesus Christ. He never wrote a song, but there are more songs written about him than any other human being that's ever lived. He never wrote a book, yet his book has sold more than every other book, and there have been more books written about him than any other person who has ever lived. He is proclaimed worldwide, believed on in the world, and that's why on Sunday in churches all around the world, they are there to give recognition to Jesus Christ because of his uniqueness, taking up the glory that is having raised from the dead, ascended up to heaven, seated on the right hand of the Father in a position of exaltation. This is the mysterious one. The mystery of becoming godly is centered on the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. He is, if you will, the master key that opens up the lock to godliness. To being godly. Stick with me now. Godliness is not tied merely to your belief in God. Godliness is tied to the mysterious one or the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. He is the centerpiece of understanding what it means to be godly and the enablement to use the washing machine and no longer the scrubbing board. Now, everyone here who's a Christian, who's received Jesus Christ as their sin bearer, should want to become godly. The one thing God has put in you is the desire to be godly, which means that you hate the point that you are not godly. Now, if you love being ungodly, then you need to raise a whole nother question. And that is whether Christ is living in you. Because the one thing that comes with salvation is a desire to be godly even if you are ungodly. I may have the addiction, but I hate that I have it and I want to get rid of it even if I fail to get rid of it thus far. 
Because there is this desire to be godly. The mystery of godliness is tied now to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, how is it tied? Titus chapter 2 verses 11 and following. For the grace of God, verse 11, has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Instructing us to deny ungodliness. There's our word. And worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly. There's our word again. In this present age. He says the grace of God has appeared. It appeared when Jesus appeared. In John 1 it says, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So with the appearance of Jesus came the appearance of grace. It's not that grace didn't exist in the Old Testament. It's that when the New Testament opens up and Jesus is introduced on the scene, the grace of God has now appeared to all men. And now it is universal in its expression. Many people don't know it, but they go back to the old covenant every time they go back to self-help. Every time they go to, I promise I'm not going to do it anymore. That's old covenant talk. That's old covenant thought because it depends on you. He says the grace of God has appeared. Romans 6, 14 says you are no longer under the Mosaic law. You are now under grace and it has appeared in a person. Jesus Christ. He says, where you get the power to say no to sin and yes to right is by the instruction of grace. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he who knew no sin became sin for us, bore our sins on the cross, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let me say it another way. On the cross, Jesus died on credit. Jesus never sinned. He was a perfect being. So what God did is he took all the sins of the world, bundled them together, and put them on Jesus. So Jesus was credited with our sin. That's what took him to the cross, and that's what killed him. He didn't die because of his sin. He died because our sin was credited to his account. So he had to pay the bill. When he paid the bill, his last word was testelestai, which means it is finished, paid in full. Everybody, watch this, who accepts Jesus, the righteousness of Christ was credited to his account. Well, how much righteousness is that? That's righteousness that fulfilled all the requirements of the Old Testament. So the law that condemns you and me has already been fulfilled in Jesus. But when you accepted Jesus, God credited the righteousness of Christ onto your account. So you not only go to heaven on credit, but the righteousness that God expects you to live as a godly Christian, you also have credited to you. In other words, the righteousness you're looking for, you already have. Most Christians who are serious Christians, we're not failing because we don't know what's right. We're failing with powerlessness to pull it off. Which means one thing. Watch this. That Christ in us has not been expanded. Okay, wait, watch this. When a woman gets pregnant, she has the life within her. But in order for that life to be revealed, that life must grow inside of her. And you know when that life is growing because the belly is getting bigger. The, the life inside that was only a little teeny seed once it got fertilized now begins to expand and take over room inside of her belly. You can accept Jesus as Savior, but if there is no expansion of Christ inside of us, Christ in us, the scripture says, which is the hope of glory. If there is no expansion of the life, that's why you will discover how to expand the life within so that you're living more godly without. Because just hearing more sermons on you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. The Old Testament was, was you got to do, you got to do, you got to do, you got to do, you got to do. The new covenant was done, 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 and done. 
It's taking something already done and magnifying it, not whipping yourself up. That's why, that's why when you, we hear a sermon, you get all whipped up. Okay, I'm ready to live for God now. I'm ready to serve God now. I'm ready to get rid of this addiction now. I promise I'm not going to do that anymore now. And you get whipped up in the flesh. You get whipped up because you get all excited. And less than 24 hours later, <laughs> die down. Because you were influenced from the outside without any change on the inside. If the baby's not growing inside, it doesn't matter how whipped up you get on the outside. And that's why you can go to church and not change. Jesus Christ brought grace out of the shadows and into the public square for the purpose of transforming us. The only thing I wanted you to understand now was the mystery. The mystery is Christ in you. God revealed in the flesh inside of you and the job of the Holy Spirit is to make the indwelling Christ expand within you so that you are naturally becoming more godly. You're not scrubbing it. We're told about a, a lame man in Acts chapter 3. The description of the man is given in verse 2. We're told a number of things about this man. First of all, we are told that he is lame. He's a cripple. But we're told he was a cripple from his mother's womb. So ever since he was born, he's been crippled. He couldn't stand on his own two feet. And according to chapter 4, verse 22, the man is 40 years old. So for half of a lifetime, this man was not able to stand up on his own. He was lame from his mother's womb. Now, we don't know all of his sociological conditions, although we will get a hint. But we do know he had to be poor because he was a beggar. We don't know whether daddy was in the picture or not because only the mother is mentioned. But we do know this. Ever since he was born, he was not able to stand up, so he was never able to man up. And that was a lifetime condition because he's now 40 years old. We're told a second thing about this man. We're told that his whole life depended upon what other folk did for him. Because it says every day he was carried by other folk to beg. So we know another thing about him, he's a beggar. That means he's living on tips. He wants other people to put something in his can or something in his jar or something in his hat so he could survive another day because we know he only got enough to live one day at a time. He's a beggar. So he's lame from his mother's womb. He can't stand up. Everybody's got to carry him to where he wants to go next. He's living on tips. And what's interesting about verse 2 is he was at the church house every day. It says he went to the gate called Beautiful that was at the temple. So now enter two other men, Peter and John. Peter and John are going at three o'clock in the afternoon to pray. Now that's going to be important in a second. They are taking their lunch hour, if you will, to go into the house of prayer, into the temple to connect with the living and true God. On their way in, they pass by the lame man. And then the story unfolds. When Peter and John were about to enter the temple, verse 3, he began asking to receive alms, that is, begging for money. So Peter and John are walking in, and the, the lame man says, what about some change? Can you spare a dime or a dollar? Can you give me a little something so I can make it another day? So the lame man begs Peter and John like he begged everybody else in order to just get a little something, something to hold him over for 24 hours until tomorrow he came out and begged one more time. As Peter and John pass by, Peter looks at him along with John, fixes his gaze on him, according to verse 4, 
and says to the lame man, to the beggar, to the dependent one, look at us. I right now need your undivided attention. So when the man hears this, he now, according to the verse, according to verse 5, he began to give them his attention. So he pays attention. Peter said, pay attention. He says, okay, because why? Expecting to receive something from them. So he says, if Peter said, look at me, he may be going to give me something that don't cling. He may be going to give me something that doesn't, doesn't rattle. Maybe I'm going to get some paper because he said, look at me. So maybe Peter going to do something, something special for me outside of the chump chain that I get from everybody else. So he pays attention. It says expecting to receive some, you know, some, some paper money, some dollars. Have you ever gotten a, a birthday card and shook it and nothing was in it? No, you, somebody said you happy birthday. And you shake it, expecting something to come out. And that guy, and they have the nerve to write on it. That's just right word. Happy birthday, and you shake it. Sometimes you shake it twice, thinking something got stuck in there. And you shake it, and you shake it. He says, so I'm going to pay attention, because you're going to give me something. So pay attention. Peter says to him, I do not possess silver and gold. Oh, you got, oh, you got to be kidding me. You're going to tell me, pay attention now. You're going to tell me you ain't got nothing. You're going to tell me, you know, the bank is broke. I have not silver and gold. You've asked me for money, and I can't help you. See, far too many lame people and lame men are thinking money is going to solve their problem. If I can make more money, if I can get a better job, nothing wrong with legitimately making money, nothing wrong with having a, a job that is productive, nothing wrong with that. But when you lame and the doctor can't heal you and life has turned left on you, there are some things money can't buy. And so he says, silver and gold, I don't have that. But then he adds to it in verse 6, but what I do have, mm, I don't have what you ask for. You ask for money. You ask for arms. But I have something. In fact, what I have, money came by. Far too many men are praying for the wrong thing. They're praying for a better job. They're praying for more money. They're praying for more clout. They're praying for more notoriety. They're praying for the wrong thing. They're praying for stuff when God wants to change the person. And when God can't change you and you only want stuff from God, you got it backwards. Stuff is okay as long as God has given stuff to the right person. All this guy wanted was enough to keep his lameness intact. God is not concerned with keeping our lameness intact. He's concerned with changing our lameness so we're not lame men anymore. So what Peter says is, I got something, but it's not what you asked for. What I have, I give to you in the name. Somebody say in the name. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Mm. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, stop being lame anymore. I want you to get up and stand up on your own two feet. I want you to stop depending on everybody else to man up where you should stand up. I want you to stop being irresponsible. I want you to stop being lame. I don't just want to give you a tip so you can stay lame. I don't want to give you leftovers so you can stay irresponsible. No, I want to give you that which will enable you to move on your own two feet. So I have something for you, but it's not what you asked for. In the name. So let me talk about the name. Names matter because they were designed to fit the reputation or the character 
of the person or place that is named. So when you look at something that has a name, it's giving you something that has to do with the reputation or the character of the person or place that receives the name. So let me tell you why this name matters in this context. In chapter 4, verse 7, when they had placed them in the center, they begin to inquire of Peter and John, by what power or in what name have you done this? So they're telling the man to walk. The leaders want to know under whose authority and in whose power and by what name did you tell this lame man to walk? Now, why do I want you to know that? Because the word name is associated with the word power. Name, power. They want to know what power has a name attached to it that you could tell this lame man to walk. So now, when you read in chapter 3, in the name of Jesus walk, they were literally saying, by the power of Jesus walk, because the name was tied to the power associated with the name. Let me show you Peter's response in chapter 4. Peter responds in verse 10, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands before you in good health. Verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men whereby you must be saved. So when they tell the man to walk, they tell the man to walk by the name or according to the power that belongs to Jesus Christ. All right? So he tells him to get up and walk. Oh, but it's getting gooder. Verse 7. And seizing him. 